right, welcome everybody. You all ready to get in God's Word today? Come on, man. The Word of God is so good. It's alive. It's rich. I want to take a minute and welcome our campuses, Meadville and Newcastle. We love you. Those with us online, one church, multiple locations. Cranberry, would you give them a welcome, everybody? We love you all so much. We're starting a three-week series today called Faith in Real Life. It's my desperate desire as a pastor and and just as a person walking with you by faith is to help you understand what it means to walk with God by faith in your everyday real life. How does walking by faith affect every aspect of my life? I mean every aspect, and it absolutely does. And I want to help you to understand how to walk this out in your everyday life as a believer. Three simple points I want to bring to you today, and the first one is this. How do I get real life faith in God? How do I obtain faith in God? How does it come to me? Now, uh, we, Michelle and I, in October of 93, started Victory. It's be 31 years this fall. And so, and yeah, that's a long time. I was 11 and she was 6. And, uh, but for uh, all these years, probably one of the most consistent questions or prayer request I've been asked is this. People will come and they'll be dealing with some issues. And they'll say, would you please pray for me? And I'll say, sure. What would you like me to pray? And they'd say, pray that God will give me faith. I said, I can't pray that for you. Well, doesn't he want me to have faith? Absolutely he does. Well, then why won't you pray that God will give me faith? Because the Bible doesn't teach you that you get faith by asking God to give it to you. And very often as Christians, we have a, a right desire but we don't actually know how to walk it out. And so we think that faith will come, that is the ability to to trust God. Now, when I say faith, here's what I mean by that. All faith is, in its purest sense, outside of your walk with God, is what you believe. And it's in its even deeper sense, in in the context of, of true faith, the beliefs that govern your life. The beliefs that govern your life, the way you talk, the way you think, the way you act, or the way you talk about marriage will be a result of what you believe about marriage. How you talk about raising kids will be a result of what you believe about that. How you do it will be a result of what you believe about it. Who you date if you're single. How many of you know Jesus wants you, if you don't want to be single, he don't want you single. How many of you know Jesus has a plan for you relationally? But you could have had some bad experiences. And what you believe about dating will govern your life. Everybody has faith. Everybody has faith. It's just in whom or in what. Even atheistic governments, if you go way back, 125 years ago, now the Soviet Union, which wasn't that long ago, but for some of you, you'll have to Google it because you're young enough to, it's, 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 it's behind your birth. The Soviet Union boasted in its atheism. Now, they believed in God. They just believed they were God. They made the government God. Now, so what I want to help you to see, faith in God, faith in real life, is simply the the governing beliefs of your life. Now, I want to help you. How do I obtain real faith in real life? How do I obtain a faith, listen now, in God that governs my life? Not when you come to church, but when you go home from church, Monday through, through Saturday. How, how, how do I walk this out? So how does faith come? If it doesn't come by asking for it, the Bible couldn't be, more, it couldn't be clear to tell us how faith comes. Look at it in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I don't know how to exaggerate to you the necessity of having a a daily habit of feeding on God's word daily. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And, you know, how many of you are maybe, okay, I'll talk about myself. I I have no trouble sometimes feeding myself three good meals a day and, you know, seven or 18 snacks. Anybody? Anybody, please? Meadville, Newcastle, anybody? Okay, well, don't make me feel alone right now. I just feel a little bit sensitive to my, you know, help me, Jesus. Give me a minute. We'll feed our bodies 
three meals a day and a bunch of snacks a day, but we'll feed our spirit God's word maybe once a week, if that. What you feed grows. It's called being, for those of us that have a little bit of fluffy in us, we just call it being fluffy. What you feed grows. Faith comes by hearing and hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's why it's so important to have a, necess- a habit of necessity to be feeding on God's word. Real faith, real faith in God projects God's presence into your future. Fear projects his absence. Real faith in God projects, listen now, God's presence in your current circumstances and into your future, no matter what you're facing. Fear will project his absence. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know what it's like to live in both of those worlds. Every one of us has experienced those moments where we truly were walking by faith, and we'll get more in-depth in a moment, and we, and we, we, we saw God in our, our circumstance and his faithfulness, and we saw him in our future. But when fear captures your heart, when the circumstances of life begin to govern what you believe, fear will project the absence of God in your tomorrows. Remember this, whoever has your ear, whoever has your ear will direct your life. Whoever I am letting fill my ear gate and my eye gate. These are the two resources from which you can gain beliefs in this natural world. What you see and what you hear. Your senses, your five physical senses. Whoever has captured my hearing has captured, listen to me, my life. Well, what's that really mean? How do I actually process that out? Who are you permitting to fill your ears with information. All right, let's get into the real life stuff that we're all dealing with. Have you, it, how do I say this politely? I, there's no polite way to say it. This world's gone nuts. No, I mean like they've taken steroids, gone nuts. You couldn't have made up the political scenario in the last, uh, you just couldn't have made it up. 25 years ago, if you would have written down what's happening right now, if you would have written down, and we'll mention this again at the end, and I want you to, Hear me closely when we get to it. The opening, the opening of the Olympics. It's like insanity. You're just watching insanity. Who has captured my ears? Because whoever captures my ears captures my heart and directs my life. Now, government is ordained of God. Well, not that one. Now, listen. God ordained government. Human beings can mess it up. But can I tell you what every government that perverts God's purpose tries to do? It tries to replace God. Whether that be an atheistic government or you come into our form of government where people want the government to be their source. And no matter how politicians lie to you, just between us, just us, just us, none of them care about you. Not enough to come help you. They may care about us in general, and I'm not doubting that. But if they really care about you, call their office, senator, congressman, whomever, and say, I need you to pay my mortgage. You won't get a call back. But I bet if you were a responsible, fell into some issues, and you called your family, said, hey, I need help with my mortgage this month, and I'll get it back to you. How many of you know you, you, you get some money from your family, unless they don't like you? <laughs> what I'm trying to help you to see is government, when perverted, tries to take the place of God. And as Christians, be very careful. I'm not, I'm not, in fact, in October, I'm going to take four weeks and show you what God's word says about how, as a Christian, you should literally function in, in, in your civic responsibility within government. And we're going to go through very specific things to help you to process it. Because most Christians are opening their ears to being persuaded by politicians, I hope I'm not surprising you, just us, that lie to you, who tell you what they want you to hear and have no intention of enacting policies that will bring to pass what they promised you. Because we're human. People do the best they can or the worst they can. Why am I telling you this? Because who has your ear? What do I mean by that? 
If you're saying things like this, if so-and-so gets elected, fill in the blank, it's over. Really? Really? So God was on his throne, bad election, you don't like the outcome, he fell off the throne, he's dead. Be careful how you speak. Be careful what words you let come out of your mouth. Be careful who gets to shape your future. Faith in God projects his presence into our tomorrows. Now, as I said, in October, I will go into God's word and show you how a Christian is to civically respond in our form of government. How we should respond in, 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 in scripture to an election. He said, well, that's going to be very dicey. Well, come and roll the dice, sweetheart. That's what we're going to do. Because if it doesn't matter in real life, it just doesn't matter. And let me just be, can I be, look, I'm 63. My filter's gone. Give me 10 years, come back, visit, and just you'll be like, dear Jesus, it's way gone. Well, the church shouldn't be speaking about these issues. Oh, okay, what should we talk about? Well, I don't know. Let's talk about irrelevant things. If how you live your everyday life, if how you respond to God in the context of having the privilege to vote shouldn't be talked about in your relationship with God and the governance of your nation, are you, that, that's insanity. Well, it's separation of church and state. Come on, man. Don't be ignorant like that on purpose. The state isn't here. It doesn't belong here. And, and I'm not pointing to any party. I'm telling you. If you don't know how to walk with God by faith, the next, whatever it is to the election, I don't know how many days it is, 100, whatever it is, it's going to be painful. And whatever happens on the outcome, depending on your views, may be painful more. When you walk by faith in God in real time, nobody gets to direct your tomorrow. Nobody gets to steal my hope. Nobody gets to take away the purpose and plan of God and the outpouring of his presence on human beings. Nobody, because the scripture says, this book says that in the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all human flesh. And we won't go out hiding in caves, eating dried food. He said, you will go out in a shout with a great harvest of people coming to Christ. That's what will come to pass. I walk by faith and not by sight. That's how Christians live. But how, Jesus said, take heed how you hear. What I just said was heard in three different ways. Someone who thinks I'm in full agreement with them, someone who thinks I'm in full disagreement with them, and someone who just doesn't think. <laughs> All I'm saying to you is that, do you see how easily we can even color what you think you heard? Do me a favor. If you're angry right now, go back and listen to what I said and see if I said what you thought you heard. Why am I saying that? Whoever governs your ears, governs your life, they will even be able to take when you hear something as simple as a, as a truth from God's word and pollute it in your own mind. Second point. Real life faith is an action. Say it out loud, an action. Real life faith has to result in an action or just dead religion. James said it. He said, don't tell me about your faith without your actions. He said, I will show you my faith by my actions. Faith must have a corresponding action. Faith in God must have a corresponding action. It has to impact the way I think, the way I speak, and the way I act. And I want to help you to see how to walk that out in your everyday life. Real faith in God, real faith, a real life faith, are simply living by the beliefs that are formed from either God's word in your life, from feeding on the word of God, or something the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about in your own life. And when you see it, you do it. You act upon it. So very important. And here's the question I have to ask myself all the time. And you do too if you want to walk with God. Because the Bible said without faith it's impossible to please God. And it's a simple question. Have my governing beliefs been formed by what God has said about me? Or have they been formed by what I see or what I've experienced? What do you believe about marriage? 
Maybe somebody hurt you. Maybe somebody cheated on you. Maybe somebody blew up your life. Maybe you blew up someone's life. If you're single, what do you believe about marriage? What does God tell you to do as a single person? Well, I'm lonely and pickings are slim at the church, so I'm going to go find me a feller in a bar room. Just eat rat poison. It'll be easier. (laughs) Did I say that out loud? He seems so sweet. Deep, deep, deep down he is. That's why if he wants to marry my daughter, deep down he's a nice guy. That's why I'd bury him 12 feet under instead of six. (laughs) So deep down he'd be a good person. Now I'm just having fun in church. Don't, Don't get on. It's okay. Remember this. If what I believe about God isn't strong enough to change the way I talk, change the way I think and the way I act, it will never be strong enough to change your life. If what I believe about what God has said, and you can name whatever area in your life because there is nothing, nothing this book doesn't cover. There's not one aspect, not one shred of human existence in life. This book doesn't speak clearly to it. And God doesn't have an opinion. God is truth. Not his, God's the only one that could say my truth and be accurate. Because Jesus said, I am the truth. Well, I don't believe that. That's fine. When you die in a few years, tell them that. Y'all know you get to die. Anybody, you don't get to escape that. Someday you die, you see God. Have the conversation then. Smarter to have it now. I'm talking to you about living in a real faith that affects your everyday life. Faith in your and my real life. Look at Luke chapter 7. One of the most amazing scriptures to show you how faith governs what you believe. It it changes the way you think and act. In, 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 In Luke 7 verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered into Capernaum. There a centurion servant whom his master valued highly. And if you read that in its original language and other gospels, he loved him dearly. Was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus. Say it loud. He heard. So faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. He heard about Jesus who was healing the sick. And so he responded to what he heard. He didn't respond by saying, boy, I sure hope he helps me. You never know. Maybe he'll come my way. Listen to what happened. And so he sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he's built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. The centurion, the word centurion, we get the word century. He was a a, a Roman soldier that had 100 soldiers under his authority. His servant, whom he loves, is desperately sick. He hears of the healing Jesus. He says to the Jews that he had a relationship with, can you ask him if he would come to my house and heal my servant? They come. Jesus said, I'll come. Evidently, somebody ran ahead and said, he's coming. Now, this man is a Gentile. He knows that Jews do not come under the, under the roof of a Gentile because Gentiles were considered unclean. So when he said, I'm not worthy, it wasn't, I'm not worthy of God. He's simply saying, I'm not a Jew, and this holy man can't come into my home. So he said, he sent, he said I didn't even feel myself worthy to come tell you this myself. He sends a servant. He said, tell him, don't bother coming. Can I ask you a question? If, Jesus, if someone I love desperately is dying, and Jesus said, I'm coming to your house to pray for them, I'm not stopping him. Is there anybody here that says, no, don't, don't come, never mind. And not me. I'm saying... Dude, come on, baby. Come on. Bring him on. Because you want you. But listen to what this man did. He said, don't even come. Just say something out of your mouth and it will come to pass. Let's go on reading. This is, now he explains his faith. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me or under my authority. I say. 
to this one, go and he goes. And I say to another, come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, listen now, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. And the man who went and sent and returned to the house and found the servant well. Jesus called what this man did great faith. Now, he's not even a Jew. Jesus defines great faith. Now, if you read your Bible, you'll find out faith is defined in different measures. Romans talks about the measure of faith. Jesus talked about little faith, great faith, weak faith. One place in the Bible talks about having no faith in God. He said this man had great faith. Why? I'm talking to you about faith in real life. I'm talking to you about that faith has to have an action. See, this man had, he said, and he explained his faith. Jesus, I have soldiers under me. As a Roman official, as a Roman, if you will, a, a, a soldier, he had within his power and authority to tell 100 men to walk into a battle to certain death, and they would obey him. Only with his word, charge. Every one of them would be dead. And if he said go, they go. And if they don't go, all of the power of Rome, all of the power of the Roman armies will back him. If they were to kill him, not to go. Those hundred men would be wiped out more... In, in horrific ways. He said, I am under authority. So the words that come out of my mouth are backed by a greater power. One Roman centurion does not have power to send 100 men to their death physically. But he had the authority to do it. And he said, and you have the authority over disease. So don't bother coming another step. Say it and it will come to pass. He didn't even need him to come to his home. Jesus said, that is the greatest faith I've ever seen. Faith demands a corresponding action. Real faith, real life faith is when you make an impact beyond your life. This Roman centurion, notice the greatest faith Jesus ever saw was not for the man who had it, but for someone he loved. Most of us live and die, and if we ever do trust God or endeavor to walk by faith, it's typically only for our own benefit. And there's nothing wrong with praying for God to meet your needs. Nothing wrong with that. But I, my hope is to help you to see what it means to live, to live a real life of faith. Faith in real time, in real life. We talk, if you come to victory of any length of time, you've heard us talk about the four desires that God has for every human being. He desires first that you would come to know him intimately to make Jesus the Lord of your life, and to know God personally. And he becomes your heavenly father, your sin debt wiped away. Then he wants you to find freedom. That means your yesterdays no longer forecast your tomorrows. Nobody gets the right to define your tomorrows any longer when you belong to him. He wants you to know him, find freedom. Then he wants you to discover your purpose. You have an individual purpose that God has for you. A specific purpose that he put you on the earth. And the fourth one that God desires for every human being, those that love him, deny him, hate him, he loves human beings and he desires this for every human being, whether they, whether they go after him or not or receive it or not. He desires then for your life to make an impact beyond your life. When you live and have faith in real life, in real time, a real life faith, it lives beyond you. You'll learn that in watering others, God will water you. In 1988, Michelle and I were driving through Cranberry Township. We were speaking in churches at the time. We had been married just a few months. And we were driving through Cranberry Township to go speak in Apollo, Pennsylvania. We were on Freedom Road as we drove down Freedom Road, just talking. God's presence filled the vehicle we were in, and we immediately stopped talking. We didn't expect it. And both of us at the same time had the same thing God dropped in our heart. And Michelle said to me after that, that those moments passed, she said, honey, I feel like God just said something to my heart. Did he speak to your heart about it? I said, yeah. And we were in the middle of a conversation. She said, what did he say to you? I said, well, what did he tell you? She said, you tell me first. You know the thing. I said, baby, I feel like we're going to start a church here someday. She said, this is exactly what's in my heart. And then, of course, Michelle having wisdom, she left it at that. But I said, let me tell you what that means. Any, anybody married to a fellow? GPS has ruined us. We don't get any abuse for directions anymore. 
<clears throat> because we don't get them, but now GPS tells us anyway. And, when, and by the way, when we miss a place, miss the street, GPS is really sweet to tell us to turn around. Just Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry, Michelle. And so anyway, um, no, I, I, I lose details. And so even with GPS, she's like, okay, honey, it's coming right up. Baby, I just heard. The lady was nice. Anyway, I, I'm taking that out. Let's marriage counseling later. We're going to get there. And we're driving, and we hear this from God. You're going to start a church here someday. I said, what that means, honey, is we're going to help someone start a church because you know, heaven knows, I'm not a pastor. Good Lord. And so that was 88. We're living in Africa. God deals with both of our hearts because we're praying, saying, Lord, you know, what about that Cranberry Township thing? If someone doesn't obey you and start a church, we can't help them. <laughs> I'm just telling you, we, we all take takes time to grow. And it became very clear to us we were to come back and do it. And I mean this with great sincerity. We, I tried to talk God out of that over and over again. And once we started and made a ton of mistakes, I said, I told you, you should have let someone else do this. I gave him a name even. You all ever give God a name? But here's what I want you to know. At some point, though, as we're in Africa, we're going to come back from Africa, and we know we're going to start this church. And we started this church in October of 1993. And I, and I mean this with sincerity. We, had, we didn't have a penny. We didn't have a microphone cable when we started. When we said we were going to launch, nothing. I, when I mean nothing, I mean nothing, and then you could subtract nothing from it. Nothing. But all we did have was that we knew God had called us to do it, so we started. And now thousands of people over these 30 years have added their yes to God. And everything you see is a result of that. Remember this when you have... When you live a real life faith, you will begin. Now, in my, our case, it's pastoral ministry. 99.9999999% of you will never do that. But you have a divine purpose right where you're at. And that God has a purpose for you. And it's no less or more significant than what he asked us to do. And now thousands of people through the years have added their yes. And what you see is the result of that over 30 years. You realize that if you've given your life to Jesus in this church... You are on the other side of that yes. Who's on the other side of your yes? Who's waiting for you to actually live by faith so that you can fulfill the purpose you were put on the earth by the power of God? This church is called to touch multitudes. Our two campuses, Meadville and Newcastle, are in need of buildings. We'll sh we're going to start showing you pictures that all the campuses, uh, Newcastle's already seen them, and we'll see them. The Newcastle campus, we have a building there, and we're renovating it. And we're going to move into it next fall. And there will be 1,000 people in that church, Newcastle, when we move next fall. I said, there will be 1,000 people in that church when we move next fall. And the building will be fully debt-free and paid for. I said, the building will be fully debt-free and paid for. Now, I get the biggest kick out of when people come up to me and go, oh, Victory is that rich church. We never had a nickel when we started to do something, ever. God led us, and we said yes, and then he moves. If you're waiting for God to move before your yes, you got a long wait. The life of faith is when your yes is more than just for you. And now thousands of people have added their yes. And I'm telling you that this year in Kingdom Builders, we're trusting God for $6.2 million. And you say, that's a ton of money. Can I tell you that those who say yes to God, he will use you. There are people called of God. You say yes before you even know. Do like Isaiah. Lord, here am I, send me. See, a real life faith is a yes to God for a purpose greater than yourself. And when you walk in that kind of authority, when you walk in that kind of obedience, the scripture talks about that when you water others, you actually water yourself. I long for you to live a life of faith. I don't care how successful you are, how much money you have, how many problems you solve, how happy your family is. If you don't live beyond yourself and you're four and no more, you will live a half-life. You will live and die and never know the amazing privilege of the God of the universe Using you to change the life of a human being. There's nothing on this earth even put close to it. God wants to use every one of us. Whether it be with our time, our talent, our money. 
And that's why you said, well, Pastor John, you're saying they don't have a thousand people. You're saying it's going to be paid for. Is there, are there a thousand people in Newcastle? Right? No. Do we have the money to pay for it? No, no. Then why would you say it? Because I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith and not by sight. If you're married and it's right, you've got to walk by faith and not by sight. If you're single and, you, and, and Pickens is slim and you've lost that love and feeling, uh, you've got to walk by faith and not by sight. And every, if your mind is being over, listen, you've got to find out what God says and walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 tells us this simple, simple statement. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. That means my life isn't governed by everything that's ever happened to me, good, bad, and ugly. Nobody gets to define my future as a child of God. No one. Because I don't live by what I feel, what I see. In a world where the victim Olympics are reigning and people fighting for a gold medal in the victim Olympics... All it is is a trap and lets someone own you. Jesus said, for freedom, I made you free. You're no one's victim. I didn't say what happened to you was fair. But nobody gets to own your future when somebody purchased you with blood and that somebody was a son, the son of the living God. He gets to define my tomorrow. Nothing else and no one else. And that's same for you no matter what heartache you may be dealing with right now. Walk by faith and not by sight. It is not a, 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 a simple suggestion. It is a command. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we'll talk about in these next two weeks to come. It's impossible to please God without faith. What does that mean? Nobody gets to govern my life. Nobody gets to govern the way I think, speak, and act, and do other than the one who purchased me and shed his blood for me. Then lastly, living in the rest of the real life, faith. Living in a rest, a peace that comes from real life faith. How do you do that? This world, it's insanity. Again, I would tell you, if you go back 30 years and you wrote the story of the last 10 years, and the, nobody would, it would have been a bad movie. Nobody would have believed the crazy. The Olympics, the opening thing of the Olympics. And, and listen to me, please, I, I may offend you in a moment, but stay around long enough to see if I truly were offend, was, were, um, I'm offending you. I still might. That's not my hope. But there's probably something on the back end of this you're not going to expect. I didn't see it, but let's just say that's insane. Drag queens at the opening of the uh, some form, it said, some say yes, some say no. Some reenactment with drag queens and a little kid up there of the Last Supper. Whether that's true or not, I don't have the whole context. I don't need to know. All I know is that's crazy anyway. I mean, we're, we're talking about the Olympics. People swimming, jumping, running. What's that got to do with some dude dressed up like a chick? I don't know. That's a, spirit, that's a serious piece of crazy. Somebody sat in the room and said, I know what we'll do. And they went, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a, I mean, that's a, that is a bucket of crazy. You still, let, let me finish before you get, if, if you're like, really, well, that's just offensive to me. Still might offend you, but, but I think you'll, you'll think differently in a moment. Because I'm talking to you about living in the rest and the peace that comes from a life of faith. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1, let me show you a promise of peace. Therefore, since the promise, say it out loud, the promise. This is available to everybody. Since the promise of entering his rest still stands. It's still available to you today, no matter what's going on in the world. No matter what's going on in my life. No matter what things and disappointments have happened. Since the promise of entering into his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you have be found to have fallen short of it or entering into that rest. So it's not automatic, is it? For we also have had the gospel preached to us as they did. He's referring back to the children of Israel when they left Egyptian bondage. They were given good news of a promised land, just like you are given good news of a Savior. And he said, now, for we also have had the gospel preached to us just like they did. But the message they heard, listen now, was of no value to them. 
Because those who heard did not mix it with faith. If you read your Old Testament, you'll find out God told them what he would bring them to the promised land. How he would drive out the enemies and the inhabitants. And when they got there, they said, they're too great for us. And they said no to God. And every one of them, except Joshua and Caleb, two million adults, died in the wilderness when it was God's will for them to live in a promised land. He said, but even God's promise, they fell short of it. Listen now. Because they did not mix faith with the promise of God. What does that mean? They had to act and obey. And a generation later, Joshua led them and they did the very same thing. That, and God did the very same thing he would have done for them. There is a rest that comes by living by faith. Verse 3 said, now we who have believed have entered into that rest as God said. There is no real life rest outside of a life of faith. If you're waiting for peace to come through circumstances, for um, all the issues of life in my life, in your life, and the culture, and the political crazy, and can't you leave the Olympics alone? I mean, it's just like, is there anything that's not like crazy on steroids? If you're waiting for peace to come in a world that Jesus said, in the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. When you walk by faith and not by sight, nobody gets to steal your joy. No one gets to steal your peace. No one gets to forecast your future. Nobody's issues, nobody's harm to you, nobody's neglect of you get to forecast the rest of your life. You get to walk by faith and say, let God be true and every man a liar. He will lift me on high because I've known his name. A thousand will fall at my side, 10,000 at my left hand. It will not come near me only with my eyes. I will behold and see the reward of the wicked. I set my love upon you. Therefore, you will deliver me. You will set me on high because I've known your name. With long life, you will satisfy me. You will show me your salvation. Psalms 91 is your word and it's your word for me. And let God be true and every man a liar. I walk by faith and not by sight. That's what you are called to live by. That's what I'm called to live by. Listen, not once a week. Live by. Everybody say live by. It's not a burden to live this. This life of faith is not a burden. It is the only path to freedom. Let me go back to the drag queens for a minute. The only difference between me and those desperately broken people on that screen is a savior. If there's any good in me, it's because I've, he rescued me. Be very careful. Be very careful. Be very careful that what you see with your eyes doesn't make you unchristlike toward people that Jesus died for. Those men, women, and whomever was up there, and whatever they put up there, they are not my enemy. They are the object of the sacrifice of a Savior. They are the reason, as a Christian, I am here. They can receive or reject the gospel, but my prayer should be, God, open a door for them to hear the truth, that you might set them free from that broken, desperate life. That's what he's called us to do as Christians. Remember, when you point your finger, when you point your finger, there are three pointing right back at you. The only reason that I have a view that honors God is because I've been rescued by a Savior. There's nothing good in me other than a Savior. And when I refuse to let some people sitting in a room dreaming up some ridiculous opening ceremony cause me to hate human beings, I won't do it. God so loved the world without him that he died for them. I must love whom he loves. Now, let me be very clear. As a Christian, I hear this all the time. Well, the Bible says you shouldn't judge. Yeah, read your Bible. It tells you to judge. It doesn't tell you to judge the people. It says you better know right from wrong. In fact, the book of Hebrews says if you don't know right from wrong, you're an immature Christian. Only mature Christians can discern between good and evil. Immature Christians, well, you know, all sin's the same. No, it isn't. No, it's not all the same. If I steal your wallet or I kill your kid, it ain't the same. One is more horrific than the other. I'm simply saying to you is that when you walk by faith and not by sight, I refuse to let somebody turn my mouth into a, into a fountain of poison, to turn my, my thoughts into rage, and to spend my time talking about the crazy that's in the world instead of remembering, remembering 
And let me leave you with this. It would change in a heartbeat if that was your son or daughter on that platform. When others were going, that makes me sick, you would be desperately weeping. My God, that's my kid. Oh, God. Jesus, I rescue my child. We have to love humanity without Christ the way we were loved. And we are called in God, I'm praying, that in this emergent generation, God, give them a, a, a voice into the parts of our, of, our, of our culture that are so without you and that they have deemed themselves to be your enemy. Open the eyes of their heart and understanding and help them to see. Bring the gospel to them. Here am I. Send me. You cannot serve someone you hate. And you see how easily this can flip in from, from my rage of self-righteousness to stepping back and saying, oh, God, forgive me. Not, that's wrong, and that's crazy. And if you, if you can't see that, I, I really, I, honestly, then I, I don't know what to say. I, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a piece of crazy. But discerning right and wrong is very different. Very, very different. Very, very different from not seeing human beings that Jesus died for, that he wants to use his people to rescue. Oh, how he loves human beings. You're called to walk by faith and not by sight. And it's my hope in this series you will see that God has more for you if you learn how to take his word and act upon it and live and walk by faith and not by sight. With every head bowed and every eye closed at all of our campuses, if today you drew your final breath on planet earth and you, and you cease to be on earth, where would you spend your eternity? There really is a heaven to gain and there really is a hell to shun. Jesus said so. And oh, the price he paid to redeem us. You see, every human being has tasted sin. There's not one of us that have it. And once that happens, you're separated from God forever and there's no way back. You can't redeem yourself. Church won't do it. Sacraments of a church won't do it. Going to church, good work. None of that will do it. But God so loved me, the Bible said, that he sent his son to die for me. Why? Because God is holy and righteous, and he judged me guilty. And then he said, I'll put myself in a human body, born, born of a virgin. Jesus, the son of God, all God, all man, lived a sinless life. And when he was put on that cross, the wrath of God that was due you and me fell to him. God judged me guilty. Then he took my punishment. The Bible says this of Satan. Had Satan known God's plan, he never would have inspired men to crucify the Lord of glory. He didn't know God's plan. That when the Son of God, sinless and spotless, hung on a cross and was executed in my place and yours. And all of the wrath of God do the sin of the world, God poured out on himself. So much so that he called his Son the Lamb of God who will bear the sin of the whole world. And Jesus hung on that cross in my place and yours. He suffered in my place and yours. He died in my place and yours. He was buried in my place and yours. And then he rose from the dead and he conquered death. And now any human being that wants to invite Christ into their life to be the Lord of their life, that means he, gets, he governs my life. And the Savior for my sin, he'll turn no one away. It's called the free gift of eternal life. It's free to me. It wasn't free to him. So with every head bowed and every eye closed at all of our campuses, I'm going to ask you if you desire to pray with me today, if you're online, to receive Christ to be the Lord of your life and the Savior of your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. At our campuses in a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to simply acknowledge you want to receive Jesus through an uplifted hand. And then we're going to pray, all of us, a prayer out loud and together with you. The only people with their eyes open in your room are the pastors at your campuses. I want to pray for you if you desire to receive Jesus to be the Lord of your life. I'll invite you to pray a prayer out loud together with all of us and invite the living Christ into your life. And he turns no one away. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here at any of our campuses, say, Pastor John, I've never, I've never received Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord, or I'm not sure. And I want to know before I leave here that I've received the one who died for me. With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just lift your hand right where you're seated and we'll pray for you. Do it right now. Then we're all going to pray the prayer out loud and together with you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to wait one more moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. At all of our campuses, whether you raised your hand or you should have, 
Please pray this out loud where you hear it with your own ears. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. Say it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He lived a sinless life. And when he was hung on that cross, he took my place. He bore my punishment. And he died for me. He was buried for me. And he rose from the dead, conquering death for me. Jesus, I you now. From my to be the Lord. Thank you for coming. Now a child. When I die, I'm bound because Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. Celebrate with me.